we hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk about economics today. This is important because economics uh, is how you get jobs and money and uh, how those how those things flow throughout our lives. So um, it's pretty important, especially uh, as we look at a uh, at a potential Joe Biden presidency. What is that going to change? Um, how is it going to affect our lives? How are we going to recover from these absurd lockdowns that we've been living with? So uh, to help us with that conversation, I have uh, John Cochran. He's an economist uh, at the uh, Hoover Institute at Stanford. And um, he specializes in monetary policy, fiscal theory of the price level. We're going to find out what the heck that means. Uh, asset pricing. And uh, he's a, a fellow and scholar at numerous institutions uh, besides Stanford, also the University of Chicago, Booth School of Business, Becker Friedman Institute, National Bureau of Economic Research, and the Cato Institute. Uh, he writes a lot. He blogs a lot. Uh, he's the grumpy economist at johncochran.blogspot.com. Um, you can hear many of uh, his conversations with uh, Neil Ferguson and H.R. McMaster at the Hoover Institution Goodfellows podcast. Uh, you got a bachelor's in physics at MIT. That's pretty, that's, that's, that's interesting. And earned a PhD in economics at University of California, Berkeley. John, thanks so much for being on. Thanks. And, and thanks for not spending the whole hour on my bio. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, we we do it right here. I because I, I understand how um how I hate the same thing. Uh, how'd you go from physics to economics? Oh, that was uh, that was fun. So I absolutely love physics, uh, <clears throat> and I, I did my undergrad uh, work in it. But uh, you know, incentives, uh, supply and demand. <laughs> there were a lot of jobs for physicists. Uh, I realized I wasn't smart enough to be a theorist, and I'm a terrible manager, so I could never run a lab. And I had taken uh, economics as my humanities distribution requirement uh, while at MIT. I thought I loved it. So I, uh, I called them up at, uh, at uh, all the places I was into grad school and said, how about I change my major? And uh, Berkeley, uh, Berkeley let me in. And so off I went. It's the sort of thing you can't do anymore in our much more rigid educational system. But uh, it was a great adventure. And just it fits me perfectly. Yeah, I, I minored in physics. Um, and and I, pretty, I think I hit my limit there. Um, oh. The last class I took was quantum mechanics, and, and at a certain point, you're just you're you're just writing out theorems, and, and it felt to me like I was just doing math, and and that wasn't what I that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I think a minor was yeah. about my limit. I could see it and feel it <clears throat> up through quantum mechanics, and then the, the next step it became just math. Uh, but economics allows you to use freshman sophomore physics tools to analyze important social problems, it's sort of like physics in 1810, uh, where you can do it all, all by yourself and range around and think about important things from an objective standpoint, get away from the politics and the moralizing that helps that we use to analyze uh, our social problems. So uh, that that's what I loved about economics and do to this day. Yeah, it's um, well, it's important. So and, and we want to talk about how how some of the, I think, underlying presumptions on economics have changed over time. But, but, but first, let, let's hit some current events, which is, as, as, we, as we look at a, as a, at a Joe Biden presidency, what can we expect? So let, let's make some assumptions here. Um, well, let's make one assumption, that the GOP holds the Senate, okay? So, because if, if we didn't, then, I mean, who knows what the possibilities would be. Um, but let's say we do, so which which would imply that the legislative uh, the legislative side is now blocked, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not plenty that can be done um, on the administrative side and the regulatory side. Um, what do you think will happen, um, and and what do you think the the consequences will be for the economy? Well, I, I need to make a disclaimer. <clears throat> Economic forecasting is hard and political forecasting is even harder. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just, just how about some uh, rank punditry? Put your finger on, <laughs> on so let's take this from my finance hat. I always say before you start saying what the good investment opportunities are, let's talk about the risk management. Uh, you pointed out an important fork in the road, what happens in the Senate, and that certainly will determine uh, what's going to happen. Um, and it is, uh, I feel for you, because... It's going to be a holding action, and it'll be kind of fun to watch the 
New York Times frothing at the mouth about those evil Republicans in the Senate bro- blocking the revolution for uh, yeah. the next few yeah. years. How dare they? Or maybe not. Uh, we'll see what happens. But um, they, they have announced their economic team, and uh, it is uh, pretty. What, what we can look forward to is sort of the middle of the road. Uh, sent, you know, they're, they're, they're Democrats are all the holdovers from the Obama administration people who've been rising up the ranks and served in Clinton and then Obama and then are coming back. So it's, it's, you know, the, the, the same team just comes out from the, uh, from the dugout, uh, you know, with some, some new faces moving up uh, as, as they would. Now, this is important. Um, what's going on in the Democratic Party is the, the war, the civil war between the woke millennials and the Woodstock generation. And so the Woodstock generation's kind of holding for a while. <laughs> The, the centrist Democrats in in the Obama, Hillary Clinton, Al Gore kind of, right, as opposed to the Bernie Sanders, AOC, Elizabeth Warren, right. uh, and, and their friends on campus. So that's the important thing to watch: who who wins that battle. Uh, but even within the, uh, so let's presume that for the moment, the what, what are <laughs> well, it's important <laughs> to note that Obama. Sense. It's important to note that Obama didn't have that battle, right? Obama didn't have that yeah. wing of the party. Um, it was cre- I, I think he fostered it, right? And I, I, I could go on a kind of whole theory of how I think that <laughs> about how liberal Democrats, progressive Democrats like Obama, kind of know deep down that that far leftism is crazy, but but they also know that they can that they have they can have the best of both worlds. They can they can rhetorically give credence to that far leftism while knowing that Republicans will always save them from their worst tendencies. Uh, but eventually, you persuade a lot of people. Uh, to believe this stuff. And then you get AOC and the Bernie Sanders movement, and they're very powerful now. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. Uh, yeah, no, and this is actually, you know, um, this, it might be more important than economics for the long-run future of, of the republic. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's just uh, Obama. I mean, the universities uh, where I work have been nurturing this stuff for 20 years now. Yeah. Uh, it, it goes back to the Vietnam War era, really. And um, it's not just about voters and opinions. It's about who controls the institutions of civil society. Um, You you know, universities are now, they're registered in 95% and more Democrat, but they're all on this extreme left wing. Nonprofits are all pushing this agenda. They've all become politicized. Um, The, you know, the tech companies now are bowing to the censorship demands of their woke millennials. So, uh, you know, beyond the numbers that you as a politician look at for voters, um, the, the control of all those institutions of civil society has moved to this far left. And that's a movement that is far, far harder to slow down. And they'll quickly call you a racist and shut you up. Uh, so I, I think the, the, the uh, Woodstock generation's in trouble. They're, they're getting old. <laughs> and once you, let the, uh, once you let the sort of intellectuals have, the, uh, uh, have such a say, it's, it's going to be hard to slow them down. But back to yeah, yeah, yeah. What, the question though is, okay, wh- what do we think they'll do, especially from the regulatory side? I mean, you know, because luckily they'll yeah. only have so much power, but because as we've given much more and more power to the administrative state, um, you know, the, the rulemaking, um, regulatory reform, there there can be quite a bit, and um, it's it's always harder to to reverse these things, as as Trump found out. I mean, I think they did a good job of doing so, but it was slow moving and difficult. Um, and it seems easier to, to put these regulations in place. Um, you know, how, how far do you think they'll go? Well, they'll certainly try. Uh, so let's we'll just take them at their word, what they want to do. Uh, what they want to do is spend money like a drunken sailor. <laughs> yeah. They want to uh, tax mostly, not so much to raise revenue to spend the money, but tax for redistribution or for the for the uh, they want to tax in a way that looks like redistribution, but isn't really, because you'll be sure that you get your special deduction and carve out and so forth. Uh, you know, the, the hilarious. Uh, we talk about redistribution and then but they want to keep the state. They want to reinstate the uh, uh, tax deduction for state and local, which benefits nothing but very high income people on the West Coast in New York. Oh, yeah, that was in that was in one of these uh, covid relief bills. Uh, repairing yeah, exactly. the salt deduction and like yeah i'll i gotta give credit to even the far leftists they were like this is a tax benefit for the rich and i'm like thank you, <laughs> thank you. Now, this is the the problem for the democratic party is that they are not the party of the poor and the workers anymore they right. are the party of um rich people on the coasts and people who got college degrees and government employee unions 
and rich people want benefits for rich people. <laughs> they yeah. don't really want benefits for poor yeah, people. Yeah, and that's been obvious. Okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to branch off. Of, I'm going to branch. Finally gets regu- regulation. Yeah. Um. So uh, they're going to try. they the Obama era was one of regulation, uh, uh, as far as the eye can see. And beyond that, you know, regulation has some limits. There's the Administration Procedures Act. You have to go through public comment. You have to pretend to do cost benefit analysis. So they like to just write um, uh, dear colleague letters from the agencies, interpretation letters, executive orders. Uh, you know, the, the old rule of law you read about in how the Constitution's supposed to work is not how this stuff works. They just govern by edict. Yeah. So they will, uh, I think, predictably try to bring a lot of that back. Now, there is a question. Any wise administration <clears throat> quietly accepts a few of the good things that the prior administration does. You don't give them credit for it, but you start to say, whew, Thank you for taking care of that for us yeah. and leave alone. So I'll be curious to see what they do. Will they really uh, impose the Title IX kangaroo courts back on universities? Will they really send us all back to so-called diversity training uh, programs that are that are highly politicized? Um, those are just two two cultural examples. What really matters for the economy is is uh, are they really going to um, crack down on fossil fuels, try to tell every company how to run things. Uh, do they not understand uh, what, what a disaster this is to the economy? So that's my you, biggest you fear coming from Houston. I'm, not, I'm just blabbing instead of giving you a solid answer. No, well, it's hard. I mean, it's a hard question, um, but we had to talk about it. I, I think it's important. I, I, I'm certainly most concerned about the fossil fuel uh, side of things. Um, there, there, there's severe animosity, much more so than the Obama era, uh, towards fossil fuels and towards natural gas to, to the point of absurdity, um, especially when you consider that it's natural gas and fracking that is that has dropped our CO2 emissions um, back to 1990 levels. And they seem to have a hatred for pipelines. The, 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 the very visual of a pipeline drives these people crazy, which is absurd because this is how you transport natural gas. This is a safe way to transport natural gas. It's how you avoid importing a bunch of gas from Russia, um, <laughs> putting, putting it in these cargo ships across the ocean. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's absurd on its face. Um, and I, I worry about that the most, um, there's, there's a lot of ways to attack the industry from the, from the regulatory side without actually passing any legislation to ban it. This is a, a great one to talk about because regulation in general sounds too abstract. So it, the problem with it is de- it's death by a thousand cuts. Right. You don't make a, a headline. with and, it. And it's a demeanor, right? It's like, it's, you know, it's an interpretation of a regulation too. Are you are you friend are are you are you are you interpreting are you interpret is, is that is that bureaucrat interpret interpret interpreting <laughs> interpreting <laughs> the regulation in good faith or or with an outcome in mind okay because you can do both you know and um and this is a problem and I think the Trump administration was very friendly towards business and um, I think I had a much more rational outlook on the cost of benefits but um you know I fear that'll be reversed. Well, and uh, I think fossil fuels is a particular one to notice. They call themselves the party of science. Uh, There is a science that actually tells us that nuclear power doesn't generate any CO2 that's conveniently ignored. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) It is a fact that the U.S. has led the world in carbon reduction for exactly the reason you said, fracking, natural gas, um, which came about everybody wants government-led initiatives on technology. This came about despite the fervent efforts of the Obama administration. We only got fracking because the U.S. has private property rights. Europe was able to ban the whole thing, which is why we're leading them on CO2. And the the approach is a hilarious one, um, if you pretend to be science. Uh, we're going to ban- get rid of fossil fuels before we have the alternative in place. Yeah. Just sort of a moral thing. And then we'll get rid of uh, uh, pipelines is a great example. Oil pipelines. Uh, well, if you don't have oil pipelines, you ship it by train, which is way worse in carbon emissions, way less safe, uh, you know, worse on 100 dimensions. But just to sort of say we don't like fossil fuels. And the third point, it's not up front. The EPA says the hell with ho- fossil fuels. You do it through the thousand cuts. You do it through, oh, you know, this this pipeline is crossing some holy um, site or something of the sort, uh, you know, just to keep yeah. them. They, it took 10 years. They weaponized uh, the court system. They, they exactly weaponized. And now what's going on, I see it from the finance side. Um, the, the new effort, which is not just the U.S., it's worldwide, is to use <clears throat> the power of financial regulation to force uh, uh, to, to deny credit to fossil fuel yes. companies, force yes. them away. 
that's a huge and one. So that's a, the U.S. is actually joining, slowly joining that party, but that's a uh, big thing going on in Europe right now. The OCC just passed a, a very nice regulation saying you're not allowed to do that. Banks may not say we won't lend to fossil fuel. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see if the uh, if the Biden administration tries to reverse that because <laughs> it was a regulation put in place that's saying you're not allowed to deny credit to black people, which was a, a good and worthy thing for them to do. But the right. words of the regulation say you're not allowed to <laughs> deny it uh, to fossil fuels either. Uh, oh, that, so that'll be a good a test case to see uh, to see how far they go. And, and tell the audience what the OCC is. Oh yes, thank you. It's the uh, <laughs> Office of the Controller of the Currency. One of our many alphabet soup regulators uh, that, that overlooks the financial system. Well, that's a very good news. Um, we'll keep, we'll, I will definitely keep an eye on that and see if, if, if Biden tries to reverse that. That would be extremely detrimental because that's been one of the biggest complaints out of the industry is um, it's Wall Street. You know, and, and like the, the, the funny thing about how Democrats message this is so that like the, the Wall Street is always backing Republicans. Th this is objectively not true. Um, if you just look at donations to the Democrat Party, they overwhelmingly uh, Wall Street gives more to the Democrat Party. And, and, and some of this um, and, and, and the Wall Street itself has made it much harder um, for uh, for the fossil fuel industry to actually get loans, um, to actually get finance, to get insurance, things like this. But don't, don't blame Wall Street. Wall Street has no spine. And Wall <laughs> Street knows that it has, and it shouldn't have a spine. <laughs> it's, it's there to maximize profits for its shareholders. And uh, in our regulatory state, currying favor with the regulators is important. The regulators are uh, much more left wing than uh, the population and then the rest of it. So, um, and also uh, Wall Street is, is terrified of the activists. So they're not doing it. Yeah. They're, uh, you know, they, they call it reputation risk. And they're saying we're not we're not it's not that they don't want to lend to fossil fuel companies. They'll they'll lend to anyone who can pay it yeah, back. But they're, uh, but they're afraid of comments they're, on Twitter, they're off the regulators and all the rest of it. So it's just easier not to uh, not not to lend that way. Yeah. No, I, and we see that often in the culture wars where corporations are, are much more likely to um, concede to the woke mob because and again, and I can't think of any other reason except that they're afraid of Twitter comments. You know, and, and I try to tell them, like. You know, because as somebody who, who gets a lot of angry Twitter comments, you know, you have to, you, you have to take a step back and think, OK, what is this really representative of? Is it really representative of the, the common good or, or, or even the, the common the, the widespread opinion? Or is it just a few loud people, even if it's thousands? That's that's not a huge number of people. Um, but they're but they're very likely to to give into that. Um, I, think, I think the best example came up last summer. It was uh, after uh, Elizabeth Warren announced stakeholder capitalism, which will be something we'll be hearing a lot of, I think, in the next yeah. couple of years. Let's talk uh, about that. <laughs> Jamie Dimon. Uh, so it's, it's a proposal that um, companies should be legally required, not just to uh, do the best for the shareholders but also to respond to all sorts of stakeholders, to have unions on their board of directors, and basically do whatever uh, Mrs. Warren and Senator Warren and her colleagues tell them to do. Uh, Jamie Dimon, the head of the Business Roundtable, organized, uh, I think it was like 100 CEOs to say, oh yes, we're all for stakeholder capitalism, we love this thing. Uh, uh, Senator Warren wrote back quickly saying, you're not getting off so easy, we intend for you to actually do it this time, no just PR stuff. <laughs> But it's a, it's a good example of quickly caving, sensing who's about to take power and quickly trying to, uh, to, to show support with donations and at least PR, if not actual actions. Yeah. It, the, so there's an interesting dichotomy there. It, and, you know, stakeholder capitalism coming from the companies themselves, I, I don't find that all that objectionable. Um, you know, that this idea that a, that a business should, should look to more than just profit, that it should look to the common good. But there's a huge difference between that, um, that sentiment and, and government imposition of that sentiment. There's a huge difference. And um, one is okay in my mind and one is not. <laughs> a, a good profit maximizing company will do a good job of stakeholder capitalism all on its own. Uh, this, this goes back to a famous essay Milton Friedman bat wrote that sent the whole thing off about 50 years ago, saying companies should just uh, maximize profits. Because if you're a company and you mistreat your workers and you pollute the environment and you don't keep up a reputation for quality products, you won't be making profits for very long. <laughs> right. So uh, being a good citizen is just part of making profits. Yes, 
what it is is a, a bunch of words on top of government control, uh, or or not just government control, control by the bowels of government, control by the regulators, by the senators, by uh, uh, the people who force you to have stakeholders on your board of directors who have uh, all sorts of uh, uh, political aims, uh, not in the interests necessary of society as a whole, and uh, and certainly not in the interest of the shareholders. How does this debate play out um, amongst economists? I mean, how, how do, le- do left-leaning economists sort of justify uh, some of their theories? I mean, do they, I mean, well, well, you know what, I'll just leave it at that. How, did, how, does, how does this play out? How do these theories well, play out? Well, human beings like everyone else, <clears throat> and many people go into economics um, because they want to save the world. And so uh, economics is, is unfortunately, as a non-experimental science, uh, fairly adaptable to finding um, questions to which the answer is the answer. <laughs> and it is funny, actually, how so many proposals go on through the year, the answer always remaining the same and just the question <laughs> changing or the rationale uh, for it changing. Uh, so sadly, um, uh, you know, uh, economists are... are able to twist their arguments and their evidence just like everybody else. Uh, but, you know, the, the marketplace of ideas at least forces you, you know, in, in well-done economics, uh, you have to make the argument and, and substantiate it with data. And then at least slowly but surely one can look at it and say, you know, that really doesn't add up. Yeah. And you wrote a post recently about trying to understand the left and, and socialism. So tell us a little bit about that post. Um, what are your thoughts on the economic orthodoxy the orthodoxy of the left? Do you believe they're really interested in a free and prosperous society, or is it more about control and, and, and power over that society? Um, so, no. I mean, I think... Let's, so the Understanding the Left essay, which I, I recommend to your <laughs> listeners, at, uh, just Google Grumpy Economist and you'll find it. Uh, I was trying to... to more on the, the sort of the far wokey left end that pervades university campuses, uh, rather than judging it, understand what is their their motivation, even if, even if they don't necessarily understand their own motivation. Um, because if you look at it, it, it really has all the um, all the signs of a political religious cult. Uh, you have to master all sorts of meaningless words that change every day, and um, it, it's it's actually. Yeah, sort of, it feels like uh, Protestantism about 15, 1530. <laughs> you have, uh, there's an original sin that you have to work constantly to, uh, to overcome. And it, it's, it's uh, you know, it, 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 it says America is nothing but uh, racist colonialist and, and uh, we should get rid of the founding fathers. Anyway, I, I, I won't, wokey ideology is not something I'm good at explaining, uh, but it certainly is, it has a function of demonizing the opposition and um, and uh, being a way to take over politically uh, in somewhat the same way that Soviet communism did. There was a whole bunch of meaningless words and all sorts of uh, well-thinking uh, people said, oh, yes, how wonderful, we're going to save the world for the workers. And that didn't turn, turn out so well. So I think it functions in much the same way. Uh, you're, and that's the point of the essay. Your, your question about free and prosperous society I think, honestly, if, if you just listen to the left, even starting with the centrist Democrats who have just taken over, uh, the answer is no. They're not interested in prosperity. They're interested in distribution. Yeah. It's not about... It's a, it's a fundamentally different goal. It's about how we divide the pie. Uh, it's about social justice and climate justice. It's certainly not about freedom as we define freedom of expression. It's about, uh, you know, making sure everybody um, says the right things and doesn't say hurtful speech. Uh, So uh, neither personal freedom nor political freedom. I guess there's a certain amount of sexual and social freedom that is part of the agenda uh, on the left. Uh, We'll grant them that. Um, And and not general prosperity. The, The thing... I got to say, the most important thing in economics is the thing no one's paying any attention to, and that is long-run growth. Uh, why did the U.S. grow at 4% for decades after World War II? Why is it now stuck at 2% uh, with no sign of, of getting better? And there's just no force in Washington that's thinking hard about long-run growth. Yeah, and I do want to talk about that, but, but I do want to note it's important to to understand that they have a different definition of freedom. 
um, and, and prosperity, as you noted. So their goals are different, right? It, you know, our goal might be the aggregate prosperity because you, you, you can't redistribute or redistribute anything um, if you're not growing. But on the, but on the notion of freedom, there, there's, a, there's a fundamentally different definition. And, and they'll say this often, you can't be free if you don't have this service. Um, whereas, whereas the conservative mind and the, the conservative disposition is to say, no, f- freedom means no one is infringing on your rights to pursue your happiness. So we just have fundamentally different uh, definitions, and I think that, that manifests um, in policy uh, considerations as well. Though, uh, though I, would, um, I would distinguish the ideology from the actions here. There's a uh, ideology which says we must uh, give to the poor and help the downtrodden and, and so forth. Now, uh, yes, we must do this by providing them services because secretly we're aristocrats and we think the poor are a bunch of dummies. They think the poor are a bunch of dummies incapable of uh, t- taking an opportunity and doing something with it. So they have to provide, be provided for it. That's the ideology. That's not the practice. Uh, the war on poverty has been going on for 50 years now. <laughs> it looks like poverty won. Uh, certainly, um, you know, the civil rights era was 50 years ago. And if you judge from them, the problem is uh, on- only worse, despite um, uh, all of our remarkable efforts uh, as a society to do to do things about these uh, about these problems so the practice ends up being just growing the size of the government and it's a uh, and uh, and and uh, what it does in our affairs and and uh, and feeding the base which is fairly well off there's still you know we're, we're, we're talking about canceling student loans and not about helping schizophrenic homeless people uh, so it, there's a big difference between the ideology and the practice yeah and I'd, I'd fully agree with that um, it did the, the the practice seems to be about um, caring the most, right? You know, whatever, whatever, whatever feels it's the best. Saying you're caring the most, but you're paying off interest groups. So yeah. let, let's. So do you got a choice? Do you want teachers unions, or do you want black inner city kids who need an education? I I, I went to a largely black inner city high school, and I toured around the south side of Chicago on a sports team, so I kind of saw what it's like. Uh, or do you want to consign kids to a horrible education run by teachers unions or do you want the teachers unions? Well, they're siding with the teachers unions. So it is about paying off political constituencies in the end, uh, not act in the name of helping people, but right. you don't actually yeah. help people. Yeah, it, it's covered for with the language of compassion. The language of compassion is the vehicle um, for these uh, detrimental policies that's, that simply don't work. And, and I think... And fundamentally, what I what I see on the left when it comes to economic theory is a refusal to acknowledge trade offs. Um, in, in economics is fundamentally the study of trade offs. Uh, I would and, and incentives and and how those interact. Um, Policy making is and, and governing really should be the acknowledgement of trade offs. There there are no solutions. There are simply trade offs. And and it seems to me that the theories of the left um, uh, bypass that to an exceptional degree. I, I think we need to get a stone carver out. And you, you get a PhD in economics just right now from saying that. Incentives, trade-offs, and I would add unintended consequences of perhaps well-intentioned past policies. If we could just carve those on the steps of the Capitol, we'd <laughs> make yeah. a lot of progress. Yeah, uh, that's, that's for sure. Okay, so you, a, it's even among, you asked about the mindset of, of sort of left-wing economists. They tend to forget all three of those. Um, they are more interested in playing redistributor, who gives money to who, really, which is something eco- economics has very little to say about. Uh, they tend to completely ignore the incentives of programs. Uh, if we cancel all student debts, what message does that send to people who are either skimp- uh, skimping and scraping to pay for their college education at a local college versus taking on a lot of debt to go to some big fancy place and get a degree in grievance studies? Hmm, <laughs> there's some bad incentive. Uh, and, 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 it's, uh, and they think of in terms of just throwing money around rather than the, uh, the incentives of, as you said, people to take, giving people the opportunity to go uh, grab something for themselves. The, there's a vision of uh, a government check that you that you go spend while you live in a trailer. That seems to be the nirvana for uh, for for the typical Democrat. And 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 again, if we're going to throw money around, that money has to come from somewhere. And so and so, let's go back to what you said before about mm. the the need to to grow. Um, so how how do we increase our annual growth rates? You said we were four percent in the past. 
um, under the Trump administration, we, we did increase those growth rates. Um, our last quarter was uh, an, an enormous jump in uh, uh, quarterly GDP growth as we recovered from uh, uh, you know, the, the, the coronavirus um, lockdowns. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure what the next quarter will be as we have more lockdowns. But uh, putting coronavirus aside and recovering from that, what general policy should we have in place to, to obtain a, a healthy uh, GDP growth rate? So, yeah, a coronavirus will, will pass as all viruses eventually pass. The economy will likely recover back to its normal state. <clears throat> and then the question is improving that normal state. Um, and, and uh, I, you know, our discussion tends to get focused on helping this person, helping that person, stimulus and sort of a very short run. But as you look back over decades, uh, you know, we are unimaginably better off, not uh, our health is better, our environment is better, our material standard of living is better uh, than, than our ancestors. Um, this doesn't happen by accident. For most of human history, it didn't. Uh, most of human history, it was just stagnant. <clears throat> and that long run growth overwhelms absolutely everything that we're talking about within a decade or two. Now, it's, it takes a decade or two. Uh, long run growth comes from one place only, which is productivity growth. Now, that means the average worker can do more with an hour. Uh, it takes less people to do stuff. Um, so machines were great and fossil fuels were great. Uh, anything that lets us be more productive. Uh, that's it. Now, how does productivity growth happen? That's the part that nobody likes. Um, you need new companies doing new products and they disrupt old companies. Uber comes in and gets you better service and half the price and the taxi cab companies hate it. Uh, and in fact, most of the government's economic regulation is designed not to foster growth, but to slow it down, uh, to keep the old way of doing things alive, to keep the old businesses alive, to protect, uh, to keep places that are falling apart uh, alive, uh, to bend, to, to, to push a negotiation in favor of one party versus another, the worker versus the, uh, versus the, um, the, the uh, uh, factory owner. But, you know, you, we are not immensely rich because, you know, go back to 1910. And suppose we, we pass a law that says that, uh, you know, the coal mine has to pay your ancestor who worked in a coal mine $2 a day, not $1 a day. Well, that's not the reason that you and I don't work in a coal mine for $2 a day. Machines came in and did the whole thing. So that's the process. Now, why has growth slowed down? This is, I gotta be honest, this is something economists are, are deeply interested in. Uh, some people think we've naturally run out of ideas. Uh, I look at the regulatory state where you started and I see at least an enormous impediment to growth. If you ask, so we are much richer than India. Why is India not as productive as the US? We, we live on the same planet. We have access to the same Wikipedia. Uh, you can get any course you want online. Why are they so unbelievably poorer than the U.S.? We're, I, I'll get the numbers wrong. We're like $60,000 a person of GDP. They're under $10,000. How could they be so poor? Well, kind of obviously, right? They have regulations. They have an economic legal system that's just much worse. So how much better could ours be? Uh, well, when you look out the window, you know, it, it takes years, it takes 10 years of environmental studies to even start building an infrastructure in the U.S. Uh, it takes, uh, what, what, did they, what did New York take to build a subway? Like $4 billion a mile to build a subway. Um, I was looking in California, we're, we're trying to build this high-speed train. I think it's a terrible idea, but nonetheless, a progressive governor and a progressive government wanted to build it. 10 years in, they haven't laid a single mile of track Meanwhile, you know, you go look at the Transcontinental Railroad. They built that thing in four years by hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I look out the window and I see tremendous um, innovation in, in tech, in biology, in, in all sorts of things that could be uh, that, that could be fueling an immense renaissance and a sclerotic uh, legal regulatory system. Even the tech companies now, they've made the move from innovated up, upstarts into regulated monopolies in a, in a, in a 10 year period. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's a new record. And we'll see if they continue providing that growth. So growth, I'm sorry for going on, but this is the most important thing in the world. Uh, growth is the thing that matters. 
It comes largely from the government getting out of the way and letting people do unpleasant things like Uber did to the taxi companies, uh, find new ways of doing business, uh, uh, disrupt. Uh, you know, the, the electronic cameras put Kodak out of business. Well, sorry, Kodak, uh, or, or, or at least nearly out of business. The, uh, the word processor companies came in and put the typewriter companies out of business. That's, that's the, uh, the, the unhappy fact of growth. Okay, so that, well, that's one aspect of it, right? It's um, another aspect of productivity would be um, getting workers the skills they need to to be productive, yes. right? So, um, you know, apprenticeship programs, vocational training, uh, getting people weaned off of this this notion that they have to get a, a four year degree and, as you call it, a grievance studies, which I like. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and maybe a six-month uh, certification in welding, uh, which pays, you know, 75K a year. Uh, you can save up and then maybe get your grievance studies degree after that. Um, but uh, so that, that's certainly uh, something maybe liberating um, the, 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 the apprenticeship uh, programs. This administration has, has, has certainly taken on work to do that. I, I hope that's not reversed. Um, we recently had a bill, um, National Apprenticeship Programs, which um, Republicans ended up opposing because w we think it actually took us some steps backwards um, and, and favored the, the unions a lot more than it should, as opposed to um, what this <laughs> as, as opposed to taking on the steps that this the Trump administration was doing, which was, you know, a a allow allow industry to to identify where those apprenticeship programs uh, should be, as opposed to government doing it. Um, that just seems more efficient and, and more likely to succeed. So th that's certainly something too. Um, I, I agree entirely, but uh, let me uh, let me be even more um, uh, free market than, than you are. There's a natural tendency to say, oh, what, what programs are going to we layer on? One should always start with saying, how are we in the way and let's get out of the way. <clears throat> and a lot of what the government does now uh, is, is in the way. You know, people are not dumb. They know that they have to earn a living and they would like to get some skills. Uh, so um, we don't necessarily need a federal program to give to figure out what skills people need and to give it to them. We uh, like uh, getting out of the way and letting people uh, find those things on their own and not giving incentives to the wrong thing. And, you know, the student loan program, which I come back to because it's in the news, uh, you can get the same student loan for a degree in grievance studies that will never get you any job as you can for a degree in computer programming that might. Well, why are we subsidizing? people to spend four years of their lives getting degrees that uh, lead to no employment whatsoever. Uh, why, why is our, it really starts in the, uh, it really starts in the grade schools and the high schools. Uh, why are public high schools, you know, they got rid of auto shop, uh, <laughs> which used to be in high schools. Uh, yeah. I, I love the shop course I got to take. They got rid of it because, you know, everyone, you, like you said, the, the focus on four-year college, but that's that's also a focus of certification regulation. Uh, there was this war on for-profit colleges. There's a war on for-profit everything. For-profit colleges have a definite incentive to try to you know get people into um, uh, things that that earn money. Uh, so I, I would emphasize a a getting out of the you know job training programs, there's I think 47 of them already, they all fail. So mm -hmm. it's not clear the federal government's particularly good at figuring out whether you should be a welder or a machinist or, or what's uh, what's necessary there. And I, I wanna to point to something nice that the Democrats did, and I hope it comes back. Under, under Obama, uh, the Obama CEA um, noticed that occupational licensing is a huge problem. Yeah. It takes I think 1500 hours to be a certified to get a cert, uh, certification to do somebody's nails. Yeah. And then that's not portable across state lines. That's an example of the kind of things we do to lower income people that really limits their opportunities uh, to move up. And yeah. uh, I, I hope that the uh, new, the, new uh, the, the Obama economists who are working for Biden go back and, and start in their war on occupational design, licensing. And then we can work on residential zoning which keeps uh, lower income people from living anywhere near where the good jobs are. So I, I always, first let's see if we can get out of the way before we add a new program.
Yeah, oh, 100 percent. Sorry, you're a politician. Nobody got any credit for getting out of the way. Uh, look how little credit uh, Trump is getting for the deregulation. You get a lot more credit for starting a new program. I don't know how to solve that problem. No, it, it, that's it, it's more of a public opinion problem. It's a cultural problem. Um, pe- people have a bias towards action. They they want to see that that program. And but but yeah, I mean, I, I fully agree. A, a proper apprenticeship program would be simply allowing companies to do it and allowing industries to 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 create the standards to to, to do it themselves um as opposed to limiting it which is which is what we do now and, and the trump administration did take steps to to do that um and you know and and, and that the, the occupational licensing is certainly bipartisan it's uh, it's a battle that has to happen at the state level um but yeah at the national level uh we could make it so that it's um so that you can uh i guess cross apply or what, what's the word I'm looking for? It's an interesting tension. I think this is a, a larger one that your listeners might want to notice throughout. Uh, there's, there's always the tension in government that you can, the best way to help an individual uh, constituent or an industry or a group of workers is to protect them and don't let other people compete with them. <laughs> so you help the nail salon, the existing nail salons, you say, oh, we'll put in a big occupational licensing and then nobody can come in and compete with you and you get to re- raise prices. But you, you can't make everybody better off at the expense of everybody else. And that's uh, where we end up. Yeah. Unions are the same way. You know, uh, most there's this ideology that says unions will get will, uh, you know, work hard to get higher wages for the workers out of management. Well, it's hard to do because there's just not this huge pool of profits to be uh, sucked away in the first place. Uh, the main thing unions do is keep down the demand competition for labor. When unions went in in the 30s and 40s, the first thing they did is say, oh, no blacks can work in this industry <laughs> because we don't want the competition mm-hmm. from cheap labor. Oh, no women can work in this because there, there's this sorry history that uh, they, the, the advocates of unions like to forget that most of what they do is try to keep down competition for their services, right. which makes us all worse off and, and makes lower income minorities the kind of people who you'd like to help worse off. Well, the minimum wage laws have that same racist history, actually. <laughs> which yes, is that's a, exactly right. a little known fact um and at first you're like how? how how does that work and 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 then the explanation is is quite interesting it's and if you think about it well, if you raise the minimum wage um then you attract more workers um who are more affluent right more white workers say and then that it allows that business to discriminate um, more surreptitiously against black workers. This was this was actually the reason for minimum wages back then. I don't think I don't think that's still the same reasoning. I don't think there's a racist um, a reasoning or motivation for minimum wage laws these days. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll well, give my opponent some credit, similar. but but that it is the history similar, of it. It has a similar effect, and and that's a lot of what's going on now. It does. It it is. Uh, it, it helps one class of workers at the expense of another class of workers. So it helps the uh, the person who is working a minimum wage job full time, is a is a punctual worker, is somebody who can adapt to um, higher level of regulations, works full time. A kid who's uh, just out of high school or just out of jail, uh, somebody, a single mom who has to work a flexible schedule and can't be on call all the time. Uh, those are the kinds of people who lose out uh, in in minimum wages. So it's not it's not just about work versus no work. It's yeah. about one class of workers versus another, and and it ends up hurting exactly the lower end of society that you is the one that you supposedly want to help. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. They tend right. not. To vote. <laughs> another another um, element of productivity and uh, something that's come up a lot in the Trump era. Um, I think if there's a fundamental way that Trump has changed the thinking of the Republicans, and, and I think in a, in, a, in a good way, I think in a healthy way, it's the, um, it's the like, departure from, I, I think, radical laissez-faire trade um, ideology, um, where, where if, if, if we can reduce the, you know, the, this, this notion that if we're importing more goods and manufacturing from, from China and therefore in the aggregate we reduce the price of this widget by a few cents, then we're better off. And look, we can measure it. We're better off. But I think over the years we failed to realize that, uh, that there's trade-offs and that there are entire towns in the Midwest that were decimated by this ideology um, where their factories shut down. And it, it's you know, and yeah, maybe in the aggregate, we get a, a bit of a, a cheaper good here. 
But is this really a good thing? Um, and, and should there be some space for protecting these these uh, local industries and, and, and American manufacturing? And how do we do that properly? So sorry, you just ran into the last remaining radical laissez-faire uh, person. And I think this is exactly <laughs> an example. Um, and there's not really, so if we could get rid of the nationalistic um, thought that come when you talk about China, should we protect the, uh, you know, this stable taxi industry from the onslaught of Ubers? Um, should, you know, when a machine comes in that can uh, do something that a hundred workers used to do, should we uh, protect those workers and that job from the new machine? Uh, sorry, the fact that we're all, this is the process of growth. And we are in fact uh, better off uh, if we can get something cheap from China, because why? Because for China to sell us something, <clears throat> it needs to do something with those dollars. When it, if you if you spend 10 bucks on some cute little widget from China, the 10 bucks goes to China. What is China gonna do with the 10 bucks? Well, they could just put it in a mattress and that would be lovely because the US can print stuff. We can print money a whole lot cheaper than <laughs> they can make stuff. But no, the Chinese aren't that dumb. That $10 comes back to the US and they buy something else from us. Now, this is bad for the town that used to make something that China now makes cheaper, but it's good for the software developer who may, or the banker or the, uh, the coal miner or whoever it is who <clears throat> makes stuff that then China buys with the $10. So this is part of, this is, you can see why growth, this helps to make it clear why growth is so hard. The process of growth is when there's a more efficient way to do something, which is either a machine or a process or a new business or a new technology or China, moving it to a country that can do it more efficiently in the US, even just because they have lower wages. Because why are our wages high? Because our workers are skilled and intelligent and they know how to do things that they have alternatives that are better than the Chinese alternatives. So yeah, we're all better off. And if, if we are better off as an aggregate, then over the long run, we better do it. Now that's, <clears throat> I'm not heartless. <laughs> We have a social safety net, and I think it's important to keep a social safety net. Uh, I don't think targeting uh, particularly to people who've been hurt by trade, why, why should I care if you've been hurt by trade rather than you've been hurt by domestic competition? So it's important that, that uh, people who lose from this are protected uh, by the government, but they are, uh, and, and we can talk about how they should better be. So sorry. Uh, <laughs> You're not gonna give in on that, huh? Still alive uh, over here. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I just think there's a difference between um, the creative destruction domestically and creative destruction internationally. And, um, and I, I, I think it's, a, I think it's a healthy to, to acknowledge that and to think about, okay, how do we, how do we at least, because, and this is, this has become front and center in the coronavirus times where we, we all of a sudden realized that all of our PPE was being, um, produced in China. They withheld it, which is why we had a PPE, uh, a, a PPE shortage. Um, a lot of our, uh, drug manufacturing um, was was done in China. We realized this all of a sudden. We can't buy anything. Um, you know, for um, we've we've tried to uh, on the campaign side, we've tried to produce um, simple things like dog bowls. You know, <laughs> with uh, with my logo on it, and I I won't buy anything that's made in China. So we don't have dog bowls. I mean, that's, you know, it's, and, it, and it makes you think like, well, why, why is this? Does, does this really make sense? And don't we have an, a national interest in, in manufacturing uh, things that we use in protecting our steel industry? Or do we want to be completely reliant on it? So there's, there's got to be more considerations, I think, sometimes than, than, just, uh, than just the, the, um, the cheapness of a, a given good. Well, a great... The, the point of it, from an economic point of view, whether it's international, doesn't matter. Suppose I could, I could make a machine for you, purely domestic, made in America, and it turn, turns chicken feet into, into cars. Wouldn't that be lovely? We, we should have a machine that does that. Well, actually, China buys chicken feet from the U.S. and, and sends us cars. So um, buying something from China on an economic basis is no different than uh, inventing a machine that turns chicken feet in, into cars. And, and so it's now, now then you bring up the strategic issue. And, and that is, there is a point. Why didn't we have PPE and N95 masks? It's just amazing. The, the country that, that uh, you know, the, the best leading country in the world. And, and we are, we, it took us six months to start producing $5 face masks. 
what the heck is wrong with that? Well, what the heck is wrong with that is that the Food and Drug Administration <laughs> won't certify. We can't even, you're not even allowed to use masks certified in Europe and the United States. You're not allowed to sell them. So we, we are our own worst enemy. We ought to be able to make $5 face masks in the U.S. at least for $10. Yeah. So you're saying that, I mean, I mean we, can agree, we can agree on this. We can agree on this. I mean, you're saying the solution to this is to, is to liberalize our own regulatory system so that yeah. we're just more competitive. Our, our, our tax now, system and regulatory system need to be as competitive as the Chinese have made theirs. Um, and and then, we can, then we don't have to worry about this. The strategic point is is a valid one, but I think a vastly uh, overplayed one, especially if we have a flexible economy that can, as we, just kind of amazing how flexible the U.S. economy is, how quickly we've moved to coronavirus stuff. Um, but I think we should turn it around. The, the, the saying that capitalists will sell you the rope when the revolution comes, the communists will sell you the rope when it's time to hide in communism, too. Um, I think we need a diversified supply chain. I think people have figured that out. You need alternatives. But uh, the idea of uh, using strategic things to protect domestic industries, the history of this is a rather disastrous one. And let's just say two words, Jones Act. Uh, <laughs> the Jones Act, those of, uh, for your listeners who don't know, is uh, in the 1920s, I think it was packed, passed. Certainly, we need a strong merchant marine so that if another a war comes, we can send stuff uh, over to Europe. So we passed in Congress that all goods on U.S. Uh, ships, all goods traveling from the U.S. to the U.S. must go on U.S. ships staffed by the U.S. merchant marine. It has been a bloody disaster. Uh, right now, we send natural gas from Houston to Europe and then re-import it back to the United States because there are no Jones Act natural gas carriers that can take uh, natural gas from one place to the other in the United States. Uh, protecting steel, protecting cars, protecting steels uh, has been a disaster. It it, uh, it doesn't save jobs because steel is, machines make machines these days and it, it raises steel prices for everything else. So the, the, strategic, uh, the strategic thing is brought in I'll just tell one last story. I was very young. I used to work in the uh, Reagan administration, and everybody and his brother came in on national security grounds demanding trade protection. And the best one was when the, the U.S. goose down industry came in demanding trade protection against cheap Chinese goose down that we were using to fill our parkas. Remember the 1980s? Everybody wore those big parkas. Mm -hmm. Their goal was national security. Because when the war with the Ruskies come, you don't want our boys up there in Canada having to put on that cheap Chinese goose, goose down or to run out of it. So the history of, of this, uh, the, the cost benefit, uh, and, and if you really want to make a strategic argument, I'll go with you, put it on budget, put it on the Defense Department budget. If we need steel plants because in a war we need to make steel, fine. That should be on the Defense Department budget, not uh, snuck in by making U.S. consumers pay more for steel. Okay, okay. Fair I told enough. you I'm a radical free trader. Yeah, no, I, I, you're, I mean, yeah, you're at the Cato Institute. You're a scholar at the Cato Institute. And I know how much Cato doesn't like the Jones Act. <laughs> but, you know, I come from a Gulf state. So uh, I'm full. I'm fully, uh, you know, I'm committed to the Jones Act. It, it, because, because, I, because I have to see the industry, right? I, I interact with that industry. I know these workers. Um, and so, you know, again, th th these are trade-offs though, right? And like, and, and fundamentally, all we're talking about is trade-offs. It, it's, I'm not even sure it's about ideology. It's just about w which trade-off are we willing to accept. Um, and, uh, and it's important to have, I, I like that the right is having that conversation. Uh, I, I, I think it's healthy. Um, to, to, but your, to, your workers, I grant your workers, but uh, this, is the, this is the puzzle of a democratic society. The workers are going to get, uh, you know, those, those union jobs are going to go. Uh, but everybody else will do so much better. Your um, your L liquid natural gas exporters are going to do a whole lot better if they can uh, ship stuff directly to uh, New England rather than have to send it to Saudi Arabia and then bring it back from Saudi Arabia. Uh, everybody else, uh, you know, everybody else gets stuff cheaper because you can bring it from the U.S. Uh, in the environment will do so much better because right now we have uh, an enormous amount of stuff that goes on trucks. It's not obvious, actually, that your Jones Act workers are going to lose a lot because um, what often happens in these cases, if we got rid of the Jones Act, the volume of inter-U.S. shipping would explode. Yeah. Uh, stuff would go off trucks and trains and onto ships. 
Uh, now, those ships might not be U.S. made and might not be U.S. Merchant Marine Union, but there's going to be a huge demand for uh, expanding uh, expanding shipping. So it's not clear they're going to do a whole lot worse. Yeah, perhaps. Um, OK, let's move on, though. Um, so many things <laughs> to talk about. Um, well, let's, let's go to the debt. Um, you're, you're, you, you often write about the debt. Um, it's a big concern. Uh, it, it is unfortunate that I, I believe this conversation is just, it just does not take hold with the American public anymore. Um, it doesn't seem like people care. Uh, modern monetary theory is now widespread. We actually had a hearing on modern monetary theory in the budget committee last year. Um, it, it's, it's seriously considered. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to what exactly modern monetary theory is. It, I mean, at a basic level, it's just spend as much as you want because who cares? Um, that's, uh, I guess that's the... I think that summarizes it pretty well. Yeah, yeah that's, that's basically the, the summary of it. Um, so why should we worry about a debt crisis? It's, it hasn't happened yet. So, um, you know, what's, what's the limit? What are we... Why, why should we be worried about it? Yeah, um, well, it will come to bite us sooner or later. Uh, you are exactly right. It's not particularly salient, uh, either to the public or politically. We used to, uh, you know, when borrowing money, at least some uh, congressmen and senators would stand up and thunder that uh, yeah. our children and grandchildren will have to pay for this. And nobody even bothers with that anymore. <laughs> and uh, with some reason, um, people are willing to lend the U.S. government enormous amounts of money at ridiculously low interest rates. Mm. Uh, so I think this is going to go on. Uh, you know, right now, long-term bond rates are one and a half percent. That's less than anybody's forecast. You know, most people think inflation will be one and a half to two percent. So people are willing to uh, lend the U.S. government money for uh, at, at absurdly low rates. Faced with that uh, opportunity, it would take an enormously uh, it, it, just the kind of prescience that our government is not capable of to tell its voters, no, we're not going to borrow money basically when they're giving it to us for free to not just support your um, rent and mortgage and incomes, but to can't, why should you have to pay back your debts if we don't have to pay back our debts? Uh, and that, that um, that's it's an unstoppable force in the sort of same way in, in 2006 in the huge housing crisis, before the huge housing crisis, a lot of banks went to households and said, hey, look, you know, here's the teaser rate. It's a 3% mortgage. Uh, and then when the house price goes up, you'll be able to refinance. And we haven't had a housing crisis in, you know, since the Great Depression. Why should you worry? And everybody took it. Uh, I think we're in kind of the same situation. So it's, it, that's, it's going to be a strong force. Now, uh, I think this debt will have to be repaid. <clears throat> and that uh, what we're counting on is that the interest rates that the U.S. government pays staying low forever. Uh, economists are full. We talked earlier about being full of ex post answers for things. We have all sorts of ex post explanations, but nobody really, really knows why people are willing to live, lend to the U.S. government at such absurdly low rates. You look at the business plan. If I lend to a company and say, OK, let's see the business plan. What's your what's your profits? You know, how are you going to be in business? The U.S. government's business plan is, oh, we're going to keep borrowing more and more and more money and use the newly borrowed money to pay you off. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Why not... people lending money at these rates is. is So given those fundamentals, they won't always. <laughs> right. And, and is there some historic <laughs> historic analogies where where that's happened, where um, there's all this lending going on to highly indebted nations and then all of a sudden the, that that lending just stops? Over and over and over. Uh, it's even happened to advanced countries. The US arguably had a debt crisis in the 1970s uh, when we were forced off the gold standard. The UK has had uh, debt crises multiple since World War II where it's, uh, not able, where it's not able to fund itself. Of course, Greece is the one that people have seen. Now you say, we're not Greece, we're a big country. Uh, we can print up money to pay off our debts, but if we print up money to pay off our debts, then we just get a really sharp inflation instead of actually defaulting on the debts. What, what so is, yeah, the, the nightmare what, scenario is that markets say, <clears throat> you know what, uh, you know, imagine we're in a in a, the next big crisis, which will come sooner than rather than later. The U.S. government wants to bail everybody out, stimulus, uh, lend us another five trillion. While we're rolling over another uh, ten trillion, we're borrowing new money to pay off the old money. And and the uh, 
pe- people say, you know, I got better things to do with my money. I'm going to demand a much higher interest rate. Right. Once the interest rates go up, then the deficit explodes because you have to borrow more money to pay the interest. And the whole thing kind of falls apart either into a default or into a, uh, inflation all at the worst moment because this only happens if, if there's some crisis, you know, a, a, a pandemic, a recession, a war, something going on. Uh, so I think that's the worry is not <clears throat> really so much of a long a long period of high taxes to pay it off. The worry is is that uh, these low interest rates won't stay long forever, and then we're forced to a sudden sharp, painful adjustment. And that <clears throat> that's what happens. Uh, you know, our, our big problem is our entitlements, and everybody says we need to reform entitlements. And uh, unfortunately, it's going to happen later rather than sooner. And, uh, you know, governments get into a horrible crisis, and then they got to cut Social Security and not by fiddling with the cost of the living adjustments by, you know, cutting it by half. And then people are really hurt. So that's that's, that's what I worry about. And, and, and like, like you kind of briefly mentioned the, the counter arguments, which is, well, we can print our own money and we're the global reserve currency. So, you know, we're going to be fine. We, the, those those historical lessons don't apply to us. Um, but the first I want to ask you, in layman's terms, what does it mean to print our own money? I don't think we mean that literally. So like, what, what, what exactly are we talking about? The, the core of the money right now. So uh, banks have accounts at the Federal Reserve, which are called reserves. And um, if you're a bank and you have this, it's a deposit account, just like you and I have. Mm-hmm. If you have this deposit account at the Federal Reserve, you are allowed to get physical cash anytime you want. So it's the equivalent of physical cash, but it pays interest. So uh, almost all of the money that uh, the government is, quote, printing right now is just, it's in the form of these uh, bank reserves. Uh, the Federal Reserve simply flips a switch saying you, a bank, now have more money than you used to. Uh, and um, that's how we, quote, print money. That's that's a lot of the government financing is coming from that uh, right now. Like these these programs where the Federal Reserve makes a loan uh, to uh, to a company, uh, it just simply says, "Bing, you have some money." Click, flip the switch. Uh, so that's how we that's the mo- that's the mechanics of of modern printing money. And okay, and then, so what's the limit? To, I mean, in, in the ob- and you stated it. The obvious uh, outcome of that is higher inflation, and yet our inflation just doesn't. I mean, over the last a couple decades, it just doesn't seem to be going up. So what's the, what's the explanation for that? And, and when does that, when does that stop? Well, this money now pays interest. So, uh, m- money, uh, the money that counts the reserves is just the same thing as government debt. So there really is no distinction between the federal reserves reserves and the treasury's treasury bills. They're all part of government debt. And people seem to be willing to hold a lot of this government debt. Uh, they uh, hold um, they're, they're in, in bad times. They sort of a flight to quality. People get nervous about private assets. So they try to sell stocks and buy more government debt. You, you mentioned the exorbitant privilege or whatever. Lots of foreigners like to hold U.S. government debt um, because they regard it as very safe. And all that lasts as long as it lasts. Now, so why don't we have more inflation? Because people are happy to hold U.S. government debt. When do we get inflation? When people say, you know, I don't want to hold so much U.S. government debt. Let's go buy some stocks and bonds or houses and invest in real assets instead. Uh, that drives those prices up. They see those prices up. They feel wealthier. They say, oh, let's go buy some more stuff. And uh, and that that causes the inflation. So it just comes down to do people want. So people will, will, will have low inflation as long as people want to hold lots and lots of U.S. government debt. And when do they change their mind? Well, we're, we're rolling over our debt short term. So mostly people hold government debt because they think the government will be able to borrow more money from somebody else next year in order to pay you back. And you can see the fragility of this kind of system. Yeah. If I, I was to give Janet Yellen one piece of advice, <clears throat> it would be this. Do like your predecessors at the end of World We finance World War II with 40-year debt. Um, we're financing our current stuff with very short-term debt. So we're what that means is uh, the U.S. government borrows money. This is the Treasury's decision. Uh, they borrow money for a year, and then they're counting that next year they'll borrow more money to pay off this year's borrowing. If instead the U.S. Uh, Treasury said, look, it's going to take us 40 years to pay this off, let's take the fixed rate mortgage. It's like a household. We're, we're taking the variable rate mortgage, so if the interest rate goes up, we're screwed. Mm-hmm. If we took the fixed rate mortgage, if we borrowed all this money in 40-year in or even longer debt, 
Then if interest rates go up, we're like a household that borrowed the fixed rate mortgage. We paid a little more on average, but hey, interest rates go up, we don't lose the house. Uh, so that's the number one thing that uh, they, they could do to protect us from this debt crisis scenario. And then, of course, start to live a little more soberly. What's your opinions on the Fed's actions over the last decade, um, you know, regarding the financial crisis, regarding coronavirus? Um, what did they get wrong? What did they get right? <laughs> Uh, I, I don't like to criticize because it's too easy. Uh, I always get the, the advantage of hindsight. I, I recognize usually that I, I was wrong when I try to shoot from the hip. Uh, I do think um, uh, the Fed is in a hard circumstance. Um, they're, they're, uh, it's sort of like being a, a firefighter. If you put out the fire, that's great and everybody loves you, but then there's more kindling around for next time. And we are certainly in that situation of more and more kindling around. So the Fed believes that no one should ever lose money, uh, that no market should ever get illiquid, that we can't have volatility. And so it puts out those fires. The result is we got a great fire department, so nobody keeps fire extinguishers in their basement and they and they leave gasoline down there. Um, so uh, the, the um, Financial markets have grown very dependent on the idea that the Fed will always come in and bail everybody out in the event of a disaster. And that makes the whole system more and more fragile. Uh, now, I think this comes from a fundamental decision that goes back 60 years and gets worse and worse and worse, that our approach to financial crises is uh, that the Fed should come bail out people and then pretend to regulate them against taking so much risk, and then they take more risk anyway. Uh, as opposed to building a financial system where um, the financial system can withstand people losing money. People have to be able to lose money and not bring down the financial system. Um, technically, we focused on regulation to try to stop banks from taking too much risk, as opposed to focusing on <clears throat> um, not letting banks borrow in, in ways that, uh, that, that when they fail causes problems for everybody else. Yeah, the moral hazard. Too much of a cycle. I would say two things about the Fed. Too much of a cycle of bailout, moral hazard. Bailout gets bigger and bigger. They're kind of stuck in that. And this time, it's kind of shocking. At least in the Dodd Frank era, they said, "Look, we're going to bail everybody out. We understand there's moral hazard, but we'll pass Dodd Frank and solve all that." And this time, they're just bailing everybody out, and only beginning to think, "Oh, how do we put that genie back in the bottle?" Uh, which is too bad. The other thing the Fed is doing is expanding. When we think of the Fed, we think about interest rates, uh, but it's expanding its regulatory actions tremendously. And that also happened under Dodd-Frank. <clears throat> it's starting to more and more tell everybody what to do <clears throat> under the guise of supervision. It wants now to, to monitor risks everywhere in the financial system. Boy, doesn't that sound great if you want a bigger budget as the Federal Reserve. Mm. And it's moving into climate change and social policy and, and that sort of thing, which <clears throat> makes you feel great at, at the cocktail parties at Davos. But I think it's <laughs> a, a dangerous thing for the central bank to do because it's inherently very political. Right. Yeah, well, that was part of the conversation during this election was um, expanding the mandate of the Fed. I mean, right now, the, the mandate, the congressional mandate is uh, unemployment uh, and inflation. And so, well, what do you think about that mandate? What do you think about the original mandate? I mean, obviously additional mandates seem crazy. Uh, we can agree on that. Um, what about, what about the current mandate? I mean, is that, is that even the right balance? So I, I like the idea politically of, um, if you're going to be an independent agency that doesn't, isn't politically appointed, uh, isn't constantly, uh, told what to do, then you have to have a very limited mandate and the technical capacity to do something with that mandate. So the DMV doesn't take on climate change, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the DMV gets to write the, the uh, you know, we don't want the DMV writing speed limits uh, in order to address climate change. So I would rather see a Federal Reserve with a narrow mandate to, to worry about the price level and that's it. And to separate the finance, that part from the financial, the financial regulatory part is always going to be more political. Uh, I'd like to see the regulatory part much simplified, focused on on stopping the, the poison of short-term debt in the well, rather than trying to this idea that they can see risks coming and and monitor and tell banks what to do. So, do yeah, the employment uh, the employment mandate is. Uh, uh, I, I'd rather. You know, if you just do it, there was a consensus that if you just do a really good job on inflation, you will have done your job on unemployment. 
the Fed seems to be now moving into not just lowering the official magnet date is maximum employment. That's from the 1940s, you know, yeah. very key ideas. Now they want equitable employment. So they're starting to think about it's the Fed's job to make sure that every region, every racial, every income category has uh, more employment. Um, that that's That's a deeply regulatory and political thing that I worry about the Fed going to. And the Fed, of course, uh, made its own mandate to do, uh, on financial stability. That's actually, that's reasonable. That's what the Fed was founded for in 1914 was to stop. The Fed was not founded to do inflation unemployment. Um, but, and it's go, but it is going into places where it really is not mandated to go. And I think that, you know, the, the legal, uh, it's up to Congress to say, you're going past your legal limits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting on, on, on the, uh, magical, <laughs> the magical monetary theory, modern monetary theory, um, it, r r real quick, cause we kind of breezed over it before. Can, can you give a, a, an explanation of what it is and why it's nonsense? Um, it's interesting. Like, like all crackpot theories, it weaves together little bits of um, wisdom and comes up with nuttiness. Now it is, it has all the signs of crackpot theory. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I, I read and reviewed Stephanie Kelton's book and, and if your listeners are interested, they should go find my review either on my blog or in the Wall Street Journal where I can be much more precise about it. Uh, it is true that the US doesn't have to default on its debts because we can print up money. Our, our debt, the US government has only promised to pay dollars and we can, as we explained, create dollars out of electronic thin air. So we don't have to default, we can always print up money. Uh, printing up, and uh, if you read you know, Kelton's book, she says, well, but what about inflation? Printing up money leads to inflation. And then she says, well, inflation will never happen because there's always lots of slack in the US economy, always and is, the present tense. <laughs> Uh, no matter how much money you print up. And it's kind of interesting that the whole book ignores the 1970s where there actually was some inflation or, uh, you know, uh, it probably. So that, that's what, uh, yeah, yes, you can print up money and hand it out until people don't want to hold that money anymore and then you get inflation. And uh, one way of putting it is that there's a, I think, a difference of opinion of how close to the line we are uh, uh, on, on inflation. And, okay, so... I'm going to change subjects again then. Um, and uh, we've got a, a few minutes left. So I want to hit just what the, the left's biggest concern, it would seem to me, if if I were to ask um, a liberal what their general principles are, I think they often default to my principles are fighting injustice and inequality. And um, that, that feels good to say. Now, I, I find these things problematic just because these these are goals. They're not governing principles. But focusing on the inequality question, it, it always seems to me that there's, there's no standard by which inequality will be solved, right? It, it's never enough. And so it, it's, it's problematic from that standpoint. But it doesn't mean that we don't have an interest in making sure that people can rise up out of a, out of a certain um, income group. Um, that, that seems to me to be the better question. So what are your general thoughts on that? What's the best way to to increase wages um, for our bot bottom quintile of earners, um, you know, aside from mandates like the minimum wage, which we, we've, we've already discussed a little bit, it, it's shown not to work, it's shown to hurt people that we're trying to help. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't have an interest in, in uh, making sure those opportunities exist. So just from a policy standpoint, what, what, what do you think is the right way to go? Well, I think uh, you're right now, of course, there's this problem that these are buzzwords and they're not defined, and who knows what they mean. Um, you know, the, once somebody says, uh, I worry about inequality, then we're, we're already, you know, you're, you're trying to be uh, generous. You're saying, well, maybe there's, you mean something else. You worry about lack of opportunity for lower income Americans, which I think is something that we all, is true, and we all worry about. But when they say we worry about inequality, you know, they might mean we worry about inequality, which is really just envy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you and I, have exactly our jobs now, and 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 Steve Jobs goes out and invents the iPhone and makes a billion dollars. Why are we worse off? That's a good question to ask. If we simply uh, take the <clears throat> society exactly the way it is now, and and um, take take all the uh, the rich people and send them to guillotines, 
we have better inequality. How are yeah. we better off for doing that? That's when you say I care about inequality, that's what you are saying. You are yeah. saying that we're better off by shooting the rich people than we were before. I mean, and, it, it, and that comment isn't that far off since a lot of the sloganeering on the streets is eat the rich. <laughs> so it's exactly. Like you're not, exactly. We're just repeating what so they say. You're doing them. You're doing, you know, th- th- this is the problem with these words. When they say injustice, they don't mean when you say justice, you mean individuals are equal before the law and and treated um, fairly and, and swiftly um, and properly for their individual actions. Uh, and, and sorry, justice now is social justice. It's climate justice. It doesn't mean anything like what you mean when you think of justice. All right. It's more of a, it's, it's more of a. Also, these are, you know, inequality and justice goes with poverty and racism and colonialism. I didn't don't know if you've been following the the woke. We have to worry still about colonialism, even yes. though we haven't invaded a country in 50 years. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was reading the Association of University Presses just issued a statement a couple months ago, pledging itself to uh, to refrain from colonialism. I didn't I didn't know that they'd invaded countries. They, these are you have to recognize these are meaningless buzzwords. But I salute you for fi- saying, look. There's a common ground here. I don't think they'll let you off with this, but there's a common ground here. Uh, what you might mean by inequality is we're worried about the status of Americans stuck on the uh, lower parts of our social and economic uh, ladder, and that they seem to be stuck there forever, and that your guys' programs are making things worse. <laughs> yeah. uh, there is, a, there, you know, these have become industries. The industry of fighting poverty uh, will be out of business if there's no poverty. Uh, the industry of fighting racism will be out of business if there's no racism. So they have uh, a lot of interest in keeping these matters going. But yes, so let's talk about opportunity. Largely, again, let's talk about, let's start with getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've talked about the educational system, which is a crime on what it does to lower income and uh, minority Americans. Uh, The barriers in the way of um, getting jobs, of moving from place to place are still there. Let's talk about the the elephant in the room. Uh, how can you you have generations that are culturally separate, and that now more than half of children are born and brought up by single women, mm-hmm. uh, babies who are not talked to by their first and second year yeah. are just a cognitive disadvantage that you can give them all the pre K and subsidized whatever you want for the rest of their lives. Uh, that's going to stay in their way. Um, that's yeah. so I, I think. Uh, yes, what we should talk about is uh, it doesn't matter to a poor kid in Fresno who's stuck in a bad high school uh, and and will never get a job, whether a hedge fund manager flies in, in a prop or a jet, uh, which is what inequality warriors are worried about. What matters to that kid is, is uh, having a decent background, living in a safe community, uh, having a decent education, having a chance possibly to move to a better place. Uh, and get a good job, and that there's a lot we can do first to get out of the way before we layer on more problems, programs that have unintended consequences, uh, just like the current programs do. But that's what we should be talking about. Yeah, and, and I think there's a lot of space for that on the right to 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 finally fill that void with some real policy solutions. Now, some of those are harder because um, some of those are cultural, right? The the single motherhood is a cultural thing. There's not an obvious. I mean, we could. We could uh, we could reverse some of the the, the great society programs um, that incentivize single parenthood, but you know we've got to figure out how not to leave these people out to dry either. Um, you yep. know who are at that bottom rung. So that that's a complicated policy discussion, but we got to talk about it. Um, what you mentioned, which is uh, not speaking to children in their first year or two, that's enormous. Uh, that that's enormous for cognitive development. Again, how do you fix that? Um, that's well, let's just start. <laughs> So we're talking about, you know, high school curriculum. The state of California just said there has to be a uh, a new diversity training in the high school curriculum. So, so why why isn't high school include basic civics anymore? Mm-hmm. Uh, a little bit of how the criminal justice system works, which they probably need to know, and parenting classes. You can't graduate high school until you've had some basic parenting classes. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. Those are some concrete things that we could actually do. I'd also point out, um, and I would point this out many times in uh, in hearings here, which is um, the the highest growth rate in wages was the bottom quintile of earners over the last few years, 
And uh, that can't be explained by by Obama. Uh, the Obama the Obama types love to say, no, we, Trump was just sailing off of the uh, the the great growth rates of um, of uh, the Obama era. But but there was a, a clear spike um, after the tax cuts in the in the bottom quintile of earners. And so it's it's it seems obvious to me that pro growth tighter labor markets um, uh, g- generally affect the lowest quintile of earners in the most positive way. So we, we, we got to stop and celebrate this tremendously. And it's unfortunately got forgotten because of COVID. The great things that happen in labor markets for uh, minorities, for poor people, for underprivileged people, convicts were getting jobs. Um, you know, they, it's, all sorts of great things were happening just because of a tight labor market, not because of federal programs for, for one thing or another. The best protection, the less, best labor market protection you can offer people is competition. <laughs> yeah. And especially the left tends to, oh, we got to protect the worker, not let the employer exploit him and, and carve this thing up. No, the best possible to take this job and the ability to say, take this job and shove it is the best protection you could offer. And, and that was, uh, and also they, which is part of deregulation. You know, yeah. that California is trying to send to make Uber drivers uh, into employees. Well, that's just going to ruin the opportunities for those uh, kids from Fresno who I've seen, you know, drive in to work for Uber for a couple hours in San Francisco. Um, yeah, luckily, California voted that one back down because um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the California it, government actually tried to basically expel Uber and Lyft. It, it's, it's, it's insane to me. Unfortunately, I've got to I've got to leave it there. I've got another uh, meeting I'm, I'm heading to. But uh John, thanks so much for being on. Fascinating discussion. We could go for hours. I like to nerd out on uh, on, on learning about everything um, economics, and I think the audience loves it. So, uh, John, thanks so much for being on. Thank you for taking the time. This has been really wonderful, and uh, I'll be happy to come back again. Yeah, let's do it. All right, have a great day. Enjoy. Thanks. Enjoy. Try thanks. to survive out there in California. <laughs> right. uh, keep up the great work. Well, the weather makes up for the politics. Yeah, that's why people do it. <laughs> it's the weather tax. All right. Have a good one.